Okay, so we've talked about the why and the what of collaboration and partnering. Topic three and topic four, we'll talk about the how. In focusing on the how, we will be talking about the skills and the approaches required for the transformational end of partnering, that tricky end, the more complex end of the partnering continuum. That doesn't mean that the skills and knowledge that we're talking about aren't useful to other parts of the continuum, because really what we're talking about is building a more collaborative culture and a, a different way of working all, all together. Also, if we uh, operate that way across the continuum, then when the opportunities arise, then the, the potential to move along the continuum is stronger because we've already been building those kinds of relationships. If we look internationally across uh, partnerships and collaborations that work well and achieve the goals they've been set up to achieve, then these are the key success factors that consistently emerge. That's not to say that all partnerships and collaborations are the same. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. They're all different, and that's because human beings are different. But having said that, there are core things that do make a difference regardless. Having a common and shared purpose is critical. Spending the time to work out what that is and what people are willing to work together on. Reaching agreement about what we know and what we don't know. Exploring what the evidence says. Understanding from the different perspectives of all of the key stakeholders involved. Developing a shared vision of success and agreeing how we'll know when it's been reached. Co-creating an action plan, agreeing on what we're going to work together on and who's going to do what. Ongoing communication, feedback and learning. Remember our triangles of innovation. We've got to keep talking about what's working, what's not working, learning from that so that we can get consistent results. Skills, knowledge, and processes that support the collaboration efforts. This is one of the tricky bits. It's really easy to fall into old habits or use tools and strategies that were designed for competition and undermine our collaboration efforts. And across the board, the experience is that if someone plays a role of facilitator, partnership broker, um, keeping us focus on the work of the collaboration or partnership, then it's more likely to be successful. This role can be played um, by someone formally or someone informally, or in fact, it can be shared. But the reality is if you've got someone or a couple of people who keep a focus on the work of the partnership or collaboration, it is more likely to get the results. Um, that it's looking for and to do that in a more time effective way. So the essential elements, as I said before, agreeing on and identifying a common purpose. What are we willing to work together on that's going to make a difference? Getting the right people in the room, around the same table, in the same room, regardless of what background or um, place they come from. Working together with processes that are participatory, that strengthen and support collaboration, that foster the creativity and the innovation that we're looking for. Thinking about the places we come together, it makes a difference um, in terms of the sense of shared ownership and trust where you meet. And practicing those skills, being aware of what do we need to do differently in order to collaborate. Again, looking at all of the partnerships and collaborations and their success, three key principles consistently emerge worldwide. Equity, because it leads to respect. 
how do we actually work together in a way that everyone around the table feels and is treated with respect? How do we make sure that their views are heard? Transparency, because it leads to trust. That doesn't mean that people have to share everything, but it does mean we have to be honest about what we can and can't tell people. The reality is sometimes we can't tell people everything, but my experience with uh, partnerships over time is that even when uh, there are confidential issues, if there's a level of trust built, that will be shared because people know that it won't go any further. A mutual benefit because it leads to shared leadership, buy-in, and sustainability. This one people often um, rail a bit against because they think, well, you know, people should do it because it's the right thing to do. Well, the reality is that the what's in it for me or my organisation is actually a critical factor. It takes time to invest in collaboration and partnerships. And if people don't see the benefit in it for them or their organization, if we can't find and align the needs and interests, then it's unlikely that they will be in it for the long haul. So this is where that common purpose and really understanding where everyone is coming from becomes quite important. So how do we build a collaborative relationship? Well, the diamond of participatory decision-making is probably well known to you, but it is an important one to keep reminding ourselves about. As human beings, we tend to jump straight to solutions before we understand the problem or issue we're trying to address. Um, that not only misses important opportunities, but it doesn't build shared understanding or ownership if we just jump straight to solutions. So in this model, you start with the idea, something that we think we need to work together on. And then you gather people, ideas, knowledge, and you expand out so that we build a shared understanding of what we're trying to grapple with. And then Sam Trainer talks about the grown zone. That's when you start realizing, well, we've, we've spanned out and it's about time we did something with it. So you might start going in, but then you might realize you, you're focusing in too soon. You're still doing the same things in the same way, so you need to expand out a bit more. And then you might narrow your focus back in. And then you might expand and narrow in. So you might do that a few times until you realize You've actually gathered enough information or the diversity of opinion or perspectives and it's, you can actually move on and do something that's innovative or different. I prefer to call this have, have a go zone instead of a growing zone because sometimes it means we'll have a bit of a go and then we'll work out, whoops, we've, we've actually doing the same thing all over again. We need to stretch ourselves again. And it's here that we end up with our co-created action plan, where we've agreed to focus in on doing something differently and innovative. Another key concept in terms of pulling off successful partnering and collaboration for innovation and transformation is diversity. There's actually, believe it or not, a theory um, that's been proven by research that diversity trumps ability. In other words, research shows that groups often outperform experts because of their collective knowledge and intelligence. That by bringing multiple perspectives, talents, skills, knowledge together, we get discussion and discovery. It maximizes the opportunities for innovation. And it's that whole concept of looking outside the square. One way of thinking about this that I quite like is a guy named Carpenter who talks about peas in a pod. Often we just go to those people we usually talk with, the people we already know, our existing networks, and we pull those together. But we're unlikely to get anything new from that conversation because 
we're all like-minded, heads in a pod. The next concept is new, what he calls new partners in crime. In other words, we go beyond our existing circle and network, and we focus on bringing people together around the ideas, not the pre-existing relationships. And there we start getting some breakthroughs. But the thing I really like about his way of thinking about it is that he pushes us to think about who are the challenges? Who are the people who actually disagree with us? Because it's there that you can really get what I call the goals in mining the dissent, the disagreement, the conflict. Why do people think differently? What's their perspective? And really trying to honestly understand why they're challenging or have a different point of view, because that will help us see things from a very different perspective. Queensland has a bit of a reputation for doing this well, of getting everybody in the same room to have those conversations so that we can learn from one another. One way of thinking about this that Austin has recently played with is what he calls the collaborative mindset. You could cross out that mindset and create, um, call that the collaborative culture. And essentially what's that saying is, how do we move from seeing each other as competitors for scarce resources at this end to seeing each other as allies for achieving individual and collective goals? So he runs through a whole range of different kinds of areas and says, if we're at the, the low end of the spectrum, if you like, and we're not focusing on collaboration as our key focus, then our focus will be quite narrow. But if we're thinking about collaboration and partnering as a key focus, we'll go much more broadly. We'll value coming together for the synergies. That's the one plus one equals three kind of idea. We'll also focus on the opportunities to cooperate rather than conflict. And we'll be looking for those opportunities to innovate. Um, if we're not collaborating, then that's fine if we don't need to, but it won't lead to the innovation we're seeking. So having a think about this, and applying those concepts, go back and review the collaborative mindset table. If there was a sliding scale between weak as naught and strong as 10, what score would you give for your organization? How might you rate yourself? How might you rate some of the key stakeholders that you want to partner or collaborate with? What do you think it would take to improve those scores? If you picked three areas from the list as a place to start strengthening or consolidating, which three would you pick? Uh, 